Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar on the EFIC Runenthal Grant. My name is Melinda, I'm from the European Pain Federation EFIC and I'm here today with André Moreau, who is the chair of the uh, EFIC Working Group on Research, Funding and Crisis. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the EGG. Um, unfortunately, we were supposed to be joined also by a previous winner who uh, has fallen ill, so unfortunately he cannot join us. But um, André is here and he's been heading up the EGG for quite a while now um, and is actually also a previous winner, correct? Mm -hmm. correct. <laughs> there you go. Yes. So we, we go, we've gone full circle. And um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to write them in the question module and we'll be very happy to answer them. Until then, we're just going to have a little chat. Well, André, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Yes, so so indeed, as you said, I'm a I'm a previous uh, EGG grantee actually some some years ago now, and it's, it's actually one of the reasons I accepted to to be in charge of the the, the um, this Epic Golden Town grant and and overall the yeah the research grants and prizes uh, that are awarded by um, given out by by Epic. So. I'm trained as a clinical neurologist uh, in Belgium. Uh, I did my PhD also in Belgium, um, looking at uh, EEG methods to, to, to explore nociceptive processing in humans. I then went uh, for um, a couple of years in, in Oxford, at, uh, it was called the Fimrich uh, Center, to learn about functional neuroimaging and how it can be also used to study nociception in humans. Um, under the supervision of Irene Tracy, who is also, I think, a past uh, EGG uh, grantee. And then I, I obtained a position uh, back here in, in Belgium at UC Louvain, where I had um, yeah, a research team uh, exploring yeah, the physiological and pathological pain perception, uh, its modulation in humans using a, a variety of, um, of non-invasive techniques, also some intracerebral uh, EG in collaboration with the with the university hospital, yes. Wonderful. Well, can you tell us a bit about the EGG? What is it exactly? Yeah, so the EGG is, is not an egg. <laughs> it's it stands for Epic uh, Grunenthal Grant. Uh, so it's it's funded or, or sponsored by by Grunenthal, but it's it's organized by Epic uh, as a scientific society. Um, people call it a grant. Uh, people sometimes call it a prize and. In fact, it's I would say it's because the EGG in many ways it's both a prize and, and a grant. It's it's a grant in the sense that it it funds research, it funds research projects. So the applications are research projects that will be conducted. There is a clear budget uh, that is defined, and so it provides financial support to 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 conduct uh, a research project. But it's also a prize in the sense that um, yeah, in addition to to providing financial support to, to actually conduct the research. It, it also provides, um, um, I think, an important, uh, a very interesting opportunity for, for visibility and, and for networking because it, yes, it's it's a prestigious grant. It's, it's competitive. Um, it rewards promising young scientists uh, proposing, yeah, you know, um, an original research project, but it, it provides a lot, a lot of visibility for the researcher and also for the research project and, and the idea. Because through the award ceremony that that is uh, that occurs during the yeah, the opening ceremony of the the, the EFIC Congress, but also the, the possibility to present the project uh, or the results of the project um, in a dedicated workshop. So there is a workshop organized where previous grantees uh, present the the outcome uh, of of their research. And uh, yeah, a lot of effort is, is put around that and also around um, the networking opportunities, for example, for the, the EPIC grantees have the opportunity to meet uh, uh, other scientists. And so it's, it's yeah, the purpose of the grant is really to promote uh, junior researchers and, and more specifically, I would say junior researchers that are a bit at a, a turning point in, in their career. So after the PhD, typically uh, when they are establishing and, and moving towards establishing themselves as, as independent researchers. So the idea is really to give an impulse, both in terms of financial support, but also, I would say, in, in terms of, uh, of, of visibility. So what, what does the grant uh, uh, support in terms of what kind of research? It's, I would say it's actually all aspects of, of pain research, uh, all, both basic and applied 
fundamental and clinical, psychological research, any aspects of research that is, is relevant for, for, for understanding pain mechanisms in humans or uh, uh, improving the diagnosis or treatment. It can be very applied research also. Uh, so both translational and clinical research, it's, it's actually very open in, in, in the, in, in the, in the topic. So basically, it funds research projects that will uh, that aim at improving our understanding of, of pain mechanisms and improving treatments or, or management of, 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 pain, of pain in patients. Wonderful. I actually just dropped um, the direct link to um, the uh, EGG mm -hmm. on the EPIC website in the chat, because apart from, of course, a lot of detailed information on what it is and how you can um, apply, it also has some statements from previous winners, and it shows you a bit about the projects that uh, have been um, have been receiving the grant in the past. So you'll see the variety, just like Andre described, the many different kinds of projects and research that uh, have been uh, included in the EGG. Well, Andre, you touched upon this in uh, your already in your previous answer, but who should apply to the EGT? Who are the people that you know you're talking to at the moment and that you wish to see as applicants? Uh, probably you should apply to. Or, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no. So yeah, first of all, as you mentioned, uh, also so that you don't have to take notes or anything, uh, the eligibility criteria are, are, are detailed and listed on on the website. So so that that can tell you whether or not you can apply to the, to the EG, EGG. Um, so it's open to both uh, researchers, but also healthcare professionals uh, working in the field of, of, of pain, uh, but that are conducting yeah, uh, pain research and the clinical pain research. So I would say both researchers and, and healthcare professionals are, are encouraged uh, to apply. Um, I touched a bit on that uh, in my answer to the to the previous question, but um, yes, yeah, so candidates should hold a PhD, and and the the idea is really to promote uh, researchers at that stage where they, they they have this opportunity, and we know it's it's a, it can be a, a challenging uh, transition uh, moving towards uh, research independence. Uh, so. Candidates should hold a PhD, a PhD. Exceptions can be considered. Uh, that was actually discussed uh, quite extensively when we were preparing this new call. So clinicians uh, demonstrating that they have already acquired uh, a strong experience in research, despite the fact that they don't have a PhD, they do not officially hold a PhD, uh, can, can also apply. Uh, but this is a bit of an exception. So this, this should be clarified and, 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 and justified, uh, let's say. Um, the applicants should also hold um, yeah, a, a position. Uh, the research should be conducted in, a, in an institution. It can be a hospital, a university, uh, a private research institute, but, but part of an, an EFIC member country, since this is an, an, an EFIC prize. So who should apply? Uh, yeah, I think uh, relatively junior researchers, and we know that this can be quite quite wide. So it can be someone that just finished his PhD. It can be someone that has already some postdoctoral experience, for example. Um, I would say it, because it's quite a competitive prize, it should be uh, you should you should uh, um, show in your application that you that you are a promising uh, researcher. Uh, so you should put that forward. And I think it's uh, I've noticed that. For example, from from the previous call, um, I would say researchers with a with a vision, so that have a, an original idea, that, that see where they are headed and, and what they want to do, and uh, it doesn't need to be a, a wide <laughs> vision, but it can actually be even a very focused vision. But but yeah, someone that has an idea of how he would like to move forward in his field and and how his work could contribute to to his field uh, his field of research. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Uh, now, obviously, for um, most of the people, the most interesting question is also, when is the deadline? <laughs> so I'm just going to mention that right now. The deadline for applications uh, for this cycle is the 31st of January. So as of today, you have 20 more days to apply. Again, you have all the information on our website. You should know that um, we have an application form where it is not possible to save your drafts, but we have templates that you can download. So there's a research plan template, a budget template. So have a look, download all of that. And once you have all your documents in order, 
it shouldn't take you longer than five to 10 minutes to just, you know, upload everything, um, receive a confirmation, and then you have applied. And then the next step, Andre, is what my next question is, after um, someone has applied and the deadline has ended, there are people who are going to review those applications. So that's the jury. Um, you are the head of that jury, but can you tell us a bit more about the jury members, uh, who is in that jury, um, what sort of professions they have and what their mm -hmm. background is? So again, if you want to know exactly who is in the jury, the, the information is public. It's it's published on the on the website. So the, the 13 experts that, that constitute the, the evaluation panel, um, uh, they are all uh, established researchers in the field of pain, um, uh, with uh, yeah, so with strong international recognition from really around uh, Europe, um, and uh, of course, since I said we we applications can be very very diverse, so it can go from cognitive uh, neurosciences or psychology. It can be more about. Uh, Physical activity it can be very basic uh, uh, research on, 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 on cellular molecular mechanisms. It can be a clinical trials. So it's 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 it, it covers a lot of disciplines, and so that's why we we the, the selection of the jury members is really based is was done to to cover uh, all the aspects of the uh, of pain research and and the diversity of the applications. Uh, we receive so there is really a, a multidisciplinary expertise you will have some experts in clinical pharmacology you will have some psychologists uh, you will have uh, some neurologists you will have some basic scientists so it's it's a very wide expertise with the aim of ensuring that the, the panel is actually able to to appreciate the the application and to evaluate uh, the feasibility the quality of the of the plant uh, of the plant uh, research because it's really important for the jury to have the expertise to review uh yeah the the very diverse applications that we that we that we receive because that can be that can be challenging um and again several uh, members of the jury are past uh, EGG uh, grantees um and um yes the the the, the evaluation uh, uh, typically is organized in two steps. So there is a, a first uh, um, offline evaluation where uh, uh, applications are sent out to, to the experts. So uh, depending on their expertise, so they can do an in-depth uh, evaluation assessment of, of each um, application. And then we, we have a, a meeting together where we uh, look at all the applications. And then, yeah, depending a bit, uh, last year, for example, um, since there were, we had a lot of good applications and it was uh, in, in very different domains. So we select, we took the decision to actually do a, an additional round uh, of evaluations when, once we had shortlisted the number of, of applications that we, that were all of high quality. Uh, we then took the decision that all panel members would evaluate all those remaining applications so that we could, uh, so that each panel member could have a vision on all of the applications, uh, of course. And, I, I found that the process was actually quite uh, went went quite well, and uh, at least everyone agreed. Let's say on the on the final ranking of the of the applications. That's good. I think it's um, always interesting to know what happens with your application and what how you describe how, what the process is of reviewing it and figuring out. Now, for people who are thinking about applying. Um, what would you say, what is the main criteria for the jury uh, when they are looking um, at, uh, when they are reviewing applications? What, yeah, what, what are the main aspects they're, they're looking for? Yeah, again, you can find, uh, find more about it uh, on the website because there is actually a, a list of bullet points of things we found, uh, we find important when evaluating the the applications and uh, also when yeah when reviewing the evaluation process we we slightly revised some some aspects of that to try to make it clear how how the the evaluation panel would uh, would work and so both for applicants to know what they should put forward in their applications but also for the reviewers to to uh, so that we try to work with the uh, same the same same framework uh, actually when when evaluating the the application so um so it's it's divided in three main 
categories, three main aspects. One is related to the applicant, so the, the strength of the applicant. Uh, the second one is related to the, the research question. So basically, what's what's the project? What What's the idea? Uh, so the, the novelty, the originality, the soundness of the idea. And, and the third one is on the, the quality, feasibility uh, of the of the proposal uh, proposal itself. I, I, I don't think it's it would be so would make much sense to say one of these is more important than the others because since uh, since it is quite a competitive uh, grant, um, which doesn't mean you should not apply, but I mean it's it's uh, the, the the selected applications uh, typically score high on, on all three three of these aspects, but. But what I also maybe want to emphasize is, for example, if we take the strength of the applicant, and maybe that's the most important for, for attendees here, because they are wondering, am I at a good stage now? Is, is this is now the moment where, when I should apply? The, the strength of the applicant, um, it's, I mean, definitely both junior and senior researchers uh, are encouraged to apply. And so the, the, the evaluation of the, the, the applicant or the, the career trajectory um, clearly takes into consideration the number of years um, in research or the number of years since PhD. So um, very clearly, the, the the panel will not simply. First of all, we will not. We don't rely on age indexes or number of citations or things like that. Um, it's it's really an evaluation of the, the the research that was conducted, but taken into account also for how many years uh, someone has been in research. So if someone that has just completed his PhD versus someone has, that has done five or six years of postdoc, of course, will not be evaluated in, uh, in, the, same, in the same way. Related to the strength of the applicant, it's, it's probably also important to, to, to make clear in the application. Um, so it's not like how good a researcher you are, but are you the right person to do this research? So it's, it's also, I think, important to, to, to highlight the uh, the adequacy between your own expertise in research uh, and and what you actually plan to do. Um, it doesn't mean you need to do what you were doing before, but you should show that you you have basically uh, the the expertise to to build or on, to which you can build to to then conduct your your research project. Related to the research question, um, um, it's. Um, yeah, typically I see that uh, the applications that, uh, that generate enthusiasm, that's, it's important to, to generate enthusiasm. Uh, so research on, a, on an interesting topic, uh, a new idea uh, is, is encouraged, even if there is a risk of, of failure. I, I wouldn't go to the point of saying uh, we specifically promote high risk, high gain projects, but, but uh, yeah, new ideas, uh, a risk is possible. There is no need to be certain that it will be that it, that it will succeed, but of course you have to consider okay what are the risks and and how 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 we can manage them. For for the quality of the proposal, um, yeah, it's it's very important to 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 clearly state your your research objectives. What's your research plan? It shouldn't be a vague. I will study on this. It's, uh, you should it should be uh, structured and 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 also you should emphasize or or highlight uh, how it goes beyond state of the art. So. How will it be a new contribution to to the field of, of research? Um, and um, and for the quality of the proposal, it's it's important to have yeah to have a clear research plan uh, um, and 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 to have a yeah a well explained methodology. So so we, the, the the panel can can see that you have a good understanding of what you plan to do and also can evaluate the. The feasibility it doesn't mean that there are no risks, but at least showing, actually, even putting forward that you are aware of risks or or challenges that you could encounter along the way, it's bet better to put it forward, I would say, than just to 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 hide it. Um, it is important in in most of the applications to yeah to have an analysis plan and and to to justify the the sample size. So, will you actually be able to interpret your data uh, with the number of Participants, the number of observations you plan to make, and, and how can you how can you justify that sample size based on on what is is already known? I know this is something that is often uh, yeah a bit the, the obvious question for, for for in research applications, but it, yeah it is important to to justify to justify it uh, a bit. Yeah, I yeah I I think that 
more or less summarizes, I would say, how, how the evaluation panel reviews the applications. Thank you so much. We have actually received a question that works really well with what we just um, what you just told us, which is, is there any chance for international medical graduates from South Asian countries to get this grant or to apply for this grant? Uh, it depends where the research will be conducted. Yeah. So if if uh, if this is to conduct a, a research within a an EFIC country uh, institution, uh, I would say then that you would be able to check at least that eligibility criterion. Um, then, uh, if you do not hold a PhD, uh, but if you if you can demonstrate some some activity in research, you, you, you could be eligible for that second point. That would be dependent, I would say, on your past, past experience. But uh, uh, you have to take into consideration this, this uh, PhD criteria. Correct. Um, yes, exactly. So I think that's an important distinction. We're not talking necessarily about the nationality of the applicant. Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, the location of where the research is being conducted, right? So if that's location is in any of the member countries of the European Pain Federation EPIC, then regardless of your personal nationality, you can apply. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, we um, I have one question left for Andre. So if you have any questions that you want to ask of the head of the jury of this grant, then this is your chance. But I just want to mention that, of course, if you have any questions coming up in the next um, 20 days, um, feel free to send us an email um, and reach out to us directly uh, at EFIC and we'll be very happy to help or answer any questions as much as we can. Um, but for uh, André now, my final question would be, do you have any specific tips or any special advice for people that are looking to apply and how they can make their application stand out? Yes, well, well the first tip would be that uh... All grantees applied, so that's <laughs> that's definitely something uh, that we that can be ascertained. Um, maybe yes, maybe I, I could have mentioned actually when we were discussing how we were evaluating the applications. But something I, I I've noticed uh, from reviewing uh, many uh, applications in the last uh, course is that sometimes uh, some projects are too ambitious. So too ambitious in the sense that they they are proposing basically what could be an entire research career, uh, which definitely goes beyond the, the scope or the means that are provided by the EGG grant. Um, so what I noticed is that, uh, yes, original projects that have a focused objective uh, and a feasible objective are preferred because else it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to actually, to actually evaluate the, the project. So, I encourage applicants to, to propose a project that can actually be done within the time frame of the grant and, and with the available budget, which does not mean that this, um, this um, how should I say it, that, that this project uh, uh, becomes a, a part of a, of a larger project that might have some other means available and that there can be some other available budget, but it, it's it's I think it's it's important for the evaluation panel to be able to understand what will actually be done with the the granted uh, sum, and 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 how it will be done, and so that they know what exactly they are they are evaluating. So that that would be a, maybe a, an advice a tip I could give to to applicants. But Wonderful. I see we have some additional questions. We have some more questions, yes. Someone is asking, if the grant is successful, what is the deadline for the research project to be completed by? Very good question. Yes, uh, Melinda, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, or but it's two, uh, two years, right? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you have two years to complete your, uh, your research. Um, and that's also something that should be outlined in your application. So obviously, the higher chance of you there's a higher chance of you getting a, a grant if you can tell us exactly when and how you will be able to implement and conduct your research yeah. and when you'll be able to see at least you know initial results. I was a bit hesitant because with the COVID situation, things have been a bit disrupted, and so it yes, that is very true. So follow. exactly for people that were in the grant scheme in the grant cycle for between 2020 and 2021. On an individual basis, we were able to have a look because obviously if a lab is 
you know, basically closed down um, and there is no research. So research cannot be conducted. That's different. Um, but uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, that has changed now. Yes. But so your timeline should be definitely two years. Uh, and actually, uh, that is, I mentioned that previously, but uh, at the, the, the EPIC Congress, there is this possibility to, to actually present the outcome of your research uh, once the project is completed or when. Exactly. Ready. So this year we'll have a, the next EPIC Congress is actually taking place this year in September in Budapest. Um, and we'll have a workshop from previous winners, obviously not the ones that are being awarded this year, but the ones from previous years. And in order to be um, able to do so, you will have to have outcomes <laughs> that you can talk about and present. Um, now, another question we have is, is it possible to include consultants in the project and how large can their involvement be? Okay, so yes, it's definitely possible. Uh, the, the project can involve uh, collaborators, can be both uh, collaborators within the institution or collaborations outside the institution, and actually also collaborations uh, uh, with institutions that are outside the EFIC countries. So that's that's the, this, this possibility is definitely is definitely there. How large can be the involvement? Well, uh, it it should be clear that the, that the applicant is the one that is really leading this project and that he's really the one conducting this project but it, the, the involvement of of, uh, of consultants can be uh, can be relatively important if it's for help on data analysis or if it's to obtain uh, additional data um, but uh, the, the bearer of the project should should be the applicant for for sure but it's it's definitely uh, possible and and actually I would say it's something that can strengthen the proposal if it improves feasibility or if it shows actually yeah that it that it has uh, interest or so it puts together expertise and it if it uh, promotes uh, collaborations it, it would be actually a strength for the application absolutely I think we've touched upon this in a previous webinar where we had two previous winners and they both said that they had collaborators um in their uh in in their applications and that was not a reason of you know not being chosen but like you said it showed that um it was a diverse project it was a, sometimes even can be a multidisciplinary project so it's not like the person applying needs to be an expert in absolutely everything uh, they just need to show that how they can conduct the research and who is going to help them if there is an area where they need outside support in. Perfect. Well, that's it for now. If there are no other questions, then this is where we will um, conclude the webinar. I am just going to send um, the email address where you can pose any other questions. I've just dropped that in the chat. So any questions that you have um, in the next 20 days, you can always send them to research at epic.org and we will reply and help as much as we can. For now, um, all we can do is wish you uh, the best of luck. And as Andre said, the first step is to apply, to just give it a try. Um, and, uh, um, and yes, look at the website, uh, look at everything that all the resources, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Andre, do you have any last words you wish to share? No, I'm looking forward to discovering the applications uh, <laughs> beginning of February, probably somewhere along those that time. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.